This is a, a talk uh, which is focused on a relatively narrow subject, uh, which is urbanization in China as it is likely to happen in the next future. But I would like to use this occasion to, to talk a bit about the problem of very large cities and transport in general. And I think that China is at the vanguard of a type of urbanization that we have never seen before, and we have better confronted. Uh, many of our models, when I look at uh, articles and the literature, take as example of uh, effective planning cities like Amsterdam or Copenhagen. Uh, those are very nice cities, but they are different animals. They are not representative of the cities that we are going to see emerging in Asia and in Africa, and to a certain extent already seen in uh, Latin America. So uh, the first part is about labor market. You know, for me, a city is before a large labor market. This labor market has to work. It has to work. Now, a city is not limited to a labor market. Uh, obviously, if we like cities, it's not just because we work there. But everything we like in a city, uh, meeting friends, going to concert, restaurant, uh, museum, uh, being able to jog or whatever, is possible only if the labor market works. So unless this labor market works well, we don't have really effective cities. The Chinese cluster become interesting because of their size, and their size are unprecedented. Now, there are a number of things in urban which are already unprecedented. You know, when, um, when I was studying urban planning in Paris, uh, we were discussing the optimum size of cities, and most people were saying, well, above one or two million, uh, you know, we should prevent city from growing more than two million because it's too difficult to manage, it's a mess. People are much happier in smaller cities. So this, uh, this was uh, the wisdom, you know, which had the consequences, for instance, in developing country was to discourage migration. Uh, and uh, so this idea that uh, city size can be determined by planner, that is the design option, is just not true. Again, the explanation is a labor market. Large labor market, when they function, are much more efficient than smaller ones. Therefore, that's why cities are going. We have better face this reality rather than dream about designing a lot of small cities. The trend in cities all over the world is a dispersion of jobs from the central business district, the historical part of city where jobs were very, uh, very dense, to suburbs. It happens everywhere. Whether uh, the planners adopt compact city policy or not, this is what's happening. And again, the explanation can be found in economics. Uh, very large cities, in the very large city, the land in the central part of the city, especially if it is extremely well served by tr public transport, become extremely expensive, and therefore it pushed out a lot of activities in cheaper land, cheaper area. Transport mode slip, uh, split. Uh, very often, planners tend to identify a transport mode they prefer they, they may have very good reason to prefer this transport mode. And then to try to design a land use which will make this transport mode efficient. I think it's a big mistake. I think transport mode has have to adapt to the emerging land use. Now, there is a chicken and egg thing. Of course, if you have, you know, uh, a network of very efficient uh, uh, transit line, it will influence land use. But the idea that land use should be constrained by a preferred mode of transport, I think, is a mistake. 
and it's going to be very, very costly. In, in number, it's already very costly in a number of cities. The trans traditional transport mode split, individual cars, freight truck, and transit, you know, if I uh, divide it into three, uh, is terribly inefficient right now. I don't think, and we will use, uh, uh, you know, the, the Chinese cluster to test this. The car, obviously, we, you know, I, I don't need to preach to convert it here, uh, is a terribly inefficient way of moving around. Uh, not for me, not so much for its pollution or because it's, uh, its emission of greenhouse gases, which can be corrected by technology, but because of the real estate it occupies. You know, uh, and that cannot be changed by technology. You know, a car uh, going, if I move on Fifth Avenue at 25 kilometers an hour, uh, I consume, what, 60 square meter of, of the land in Fifth Avenue. Uh, and I don't pay for it. And there is no, for the moment, there is no elegant way or, or economic way to make me pay for it. So that's a major thing, you know, with cars. So they would have, however, cars, as they are designed, are not necessarily the only way of moving around from door to door. We will see that later. Finally, I will uh, propose, and this is really thinking aloud. It's not at all a, 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 a proposal which is, uh, uh, you know, uh, which is, uh, you know, well developed. I will, I will propose something for this very large cluster, a type of transport system, which I think could possibly work. And again, here, I'm thinking aloud, you know, I will accept any type of criticism on this thing. It's, uh, it's just a... So, let us go... This is basically the outline of... Uh, so, I, I don't need to go much further on that. You know, there, there's a large literature on the size of labor market. Uh, a large urban market is not necessarily an area where density are high, or where there are a lot of people. It's assumed that within this market, you can move from point A to point B randomly in less than one hour. Uh, some economists even say that below 20 minute transit time, uh, productivity decrease, you know, compared to what it will be. You could argue about that, I would take, uh, you know, one hour as a maximum. Uh, so you could have, for instance, if I take uh, some area of rural area of Bangladesh or China, I may have densities which are, uh, you know, very similar to uh, the density of Paris, for instance. But I do not have a labor market because from village to village, there is no transport, there is no market. So you have a large concentration of people without a labor market. So labor market is not equivalent of a number of people working in a certain area. Labor market implies transport, which allow you to go randomly from one port to another. So what is important in a city, uh, in a very large city, is to try to measure what is the effective size of the labor market. And if you have a city like, say, you take Mexico City, my guess is that Mexico City is divided into a number of labor markets because you cannot go from the south to the north, you know, if you live in the south and you find a nice job in the north, you, you will spend probably three hours going there and maybe uh, 25 or 30 or 40 percent of your income. So you are not, so you have a fragmented uh, labor market. Now, if it was possible to, uh, to harmonize, you know, to link all the labor market of Mexico City into one with a very effective uh, transport system, then you will see a, a productivity, an enormous gain in productivity. You will see also a, a gain in welfare from the lowest income people. Uh, I, have, uh, I had a colleague in the World Bank some years ago who were in admiration uh, after having done a survey in Dharavi, you know, one of the largest slums in Mumbai. Mumbai. Uh, they were in admiration for the slum because they say, all these people walk to work, 
and therefore their job is within, let's say, four or five kilometers from the IV. Isn't it a wonderful model, you know, that uh, you could have, this is terrible, this is why they are poor, you know, if they could, if the people of Davi could, you know, uh, commute to an area where they are better paid than where they are, their income will increase. Uh, if employers uh, could find people of Davi, you know, who have, who have a factory in the north or something, could find employees from Davi, uh, their productivity will increase. So you see, this uh, this mobility uh, due to to labor market is very important. Now, let's look at Chinese urban clusters because, again, I think they they are a bit uh, uh, they are very challenging because they are so unique. Their size first. Uh, first, why did the Chinese government declare that recently? You know, it's relatively recent, uh, 2014. Uh, they. They declared, you know, up to up to that time, uh, the Chinese consider cities as individual cities, and uh, you could see that by the way uh, the road network was built. You know, the, all the the large Chinese uh, cities have uh, ring roads, which develop your know, concentric ring roads. That was the way the city would grow, and it implies, in fact, a, an image of the city as a radio concentric system. Uh, and suddenly, so they, they look at cities that way. And suddenly they shifted and they say, we are going to look at clusters rather than saying, we are going to do this in Beijing and this, you know, in, in Zhangzhou. They say, we are going to look at clusters. Why? Not because suddenly they decided that cluster will work, because those clusters already existed. You know, when when Apple is telling us that they can manufacture, assemble the Apple iPhone, iPhone only in China because of uh, the supply chain which has established there, they are talking about clusters. So those clusters exist. They, are, they have been spontaneous. They have been, uh, they have been generated by the type of urbanization in China, not by the central government. The central government never thought of that. They thought of individual cities as discrete elements, you know, especially discrete political elements. Now, when the Chinese government say we are changing policy, you have to take them seriously. Uh, a lot of countries declare policy, and my experience is that you take them seriously or you don't. In China, you have to take them seriously because Chinese are good at one thing, is logistics. They do logistics very well. Sometimes it serves them well, like, for instance, when they develop the intercity network, you know, in the last 20 years, it's fantastic, or the rail network, or the subway of uh, Shanghai or Beijing, you know, the logistic is incredible to develop a subway so fast. Of course, it has its downside too, you know, if uh, you know, if the Great Leap Forward was so devastating, it's precisely because they did it, and they did it in a short time. So when the government decides a policy, you have to take it seriously. These are the, the there, there are more clusters than that, but these are the major ones. Uh, you know, most of them are in the East Coast. There is one very large one, uh, you know, in uh, uh, in Sichuan, you know, more in the west, and then one along the, the Yangtze, but basically they are. Uh, so what is unprecedented is that as the Chinese have identified them, they are talking about integrated labor market of 100 million people. You know, that's a cluster, Beijing, Tianjin, Hebei cluster. The the distribution of density with this uh, cluster already exists. This is the existing, this is not a projected population. This is a population now, you know, now. And they are going to attract more people. Don't forget that China now is urbanized at what, 58% uh, or something, or something like that, the latest figure. So it has still a long way to go. Um, the, so those, uh, those clusters have been, uh, are already existing. 
the, the idea of the Chinese is to make them even more integrated and not to look at a city like, like Shanghai or Beijing in itself, but at the cluster itself as a total, and not considering that uh, smaller city in the cluster are suburbs of Beijing or Shanghai, but they are part of the economic, of the entire economic system. Uh, this is a map of uh, you know, the northern one, and I have put in yellow here. So the, the, all the red here are all the counties you know, the, uh, which are part of this uh, uh, cluster. You, know, you, you see the total here, the, the detail of this 100 million. Now, the, the urbanization in the, in the bottom uh, left here, uh, if you go there, I'm not completely convinced that they are really yet part of the cluster, but they will be. And what is certainly part of the cluster is the two yellow counties here, Tianjin and Beijing, and, and the one just around, around them here. So I extract from that just a little part of it, uh, which represents here you know, 30, 33 million people in 2010. So we could say probably now 38 million people, maybe 40 million people. This is Beijing. Beijing to the to the Six Ring Road, uh, this this red area has 13 million people. Tianjin, Third Ring Road, within Third Ring Road, practically five million people. And then the the port area here, uh, Binhai, uh, there are eight million people. If you take the adjacent area, it's probably a million and a half. Now. Within this area, and again, this is only one third of the existing you know, uh, uh, cluster, we have a dispersed population of practically 16 million people. And you see here the pattern of urbanization. They are small town, but they are also completely dispersed population. Uh, now, some, you, you, you will still find here some agricultural area here and there, but basically, if you look at the labor there, everybody is working in cities. Their mean of transport, either the, the truck, the car, or the motorcycle. So you have a movement, you have 16 million people here who are moving around, who are completely out of reach of any type of transit as we know it because of the dispersion of job and population. Don't forget that the jobs that those people, those 16 million are, are working in, are not necessarily in Beijing or not necessarily in Tianjin. They might be somewhere else. For instance, say, uh, there is a new Airbus factory, which is in between here, uh, which is not, you know, it's in the middle of this conurbation. Obviously, it's going to attract a lot of people, not only workers at the Airbus factory, but all you know, the people who, feed, you know, the, the subcontractor who work f for, for this. This is why Airbus is there. It's not necessarily for the labor. It's for, for the supply chain. So you have, again, those enormous supply chains. Uh, I advance a bit my argument that we know how to transport people within Beijing, you know, and, and the Chinese have shown that, you know, the, the, the subway is Sub is really wonderfully organized. The subway is linked to uh, bus feeders, and also they have a number of uh, BRT lines on top of it. Uh, so that already work at the limit. We don't know how to transport people, so that means to, uh, you know, to integrate the labor market. In that. To give you a sense of scale, so I am back here. On the left, I have uh, Beijing and Tianjin with a built-up area. So 36 million people. Here I have Seoul, a uh, metropolitan area. See, the, the municipality of Seoul with 12 million people is just here in the, you know, in the center here. You have Incheon here. And this is Seoul metropolitan area, 20 million people. You see that that's already also a different animal. This is still, in a certain way, a monocentric city. It is not yet a, a real cluster, although it starts working as a cluster. Uh, this is Paris, and all this at, at the same scale, uh, which has only here 12 million people. And you see, again, it's a, it's a monocentric city which has grown very large suburbs. This is not what the Chinese are talking about. Another cluster 
which again developed spontaneously. It's uh, the Peel River Delta. You know, we have here at the bottom here, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, Guangzhou, and all the other, you know, Macau and all this. These are not, you know, you have here 64 million people, not completely integrated uh, as a labor market, but very close. You know, the, the, uh, since this map was done, there are two more bridges here, by the way, who are crossing the bay, uh, so which tend to, to integrate those labor markets. The, the strength of the Peel River Delta is, of course, these 64 million people. It's not just that you have Shenzhen and Hong Kong and, and that, you know. So, again, those clusters are already here. And what I'm saying is that we don't know how to transport those people except maybe with motorcycle. And the motorcycle is not very satisfactory as it is now, designed now, uh, especially, you know, it's polluting, it's uh, dangerous, uh, the roads are not designed for motorcycle, traffic is not designed. Uh, but it's basically, you know, the only system outside the very dense area, you know, the, the three very dense area, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, and Mengzhou, where then within this very dense area, the the transit system can take over uh, in the interland. We don't know how to transport people. And our, uh, when you look at transport planning, uh, you have a tendency to, to extend lines in those suburbs and to assume that there will be feeders. And those lines are in fact feeding the three main uh, transport hub, you know, which are the three main CBD. Guangzhou, Shenzhen, and Hong Kong. And that's not the way the traffic works in, the, in these things anymore. Now, uh, people will say, well, we, we have also clusters. So this is, uh, the, the Bay Area is a cluster. There's no doubt about it. And by the way, like the Chinese clusters, the Bay Area, especially Silicon Valley, was not developed by planners who say, let us develop Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley was an accident. I, it was not an accident. You can explain it by Stanford and uh, Menlo Park or whatever. But uh, it was never planned. If I had to congratulate the planners of Silicon Valley, is not to have designed it or planned it. I congratulate them for not having killed it. Um, because I could see in a number of countries Silicon Valley emerging and urban planners killing it by not providing enough infrastructure, not providing power or water supply. I guess that they will be, by now, if there have been an effective, uh, you know, power system, you know, and, and infrastructure system, in Lagos and in Gauteng in Johannesburg, you will have, uh, you will have a Silicon Valley in Gauteng and you will have uh, one in Lagos probably. They were killed by planners. My European colleague, colleague always quotes the Randstad as a, you know, Randstad is, uh, uh, you know, in Holland, it's, uh, you know, Amsterdam, uh, Groningen, uh, Rotterdam, and uh, The Hague, uh, you know, the, which, are, which work as a cluster in a way because you have excellent transport b between the, those, those cities. And, but we're talking about 7 million people here. You know, it's very small. It's, it's like, you know, the entire Bay Area, 6.2 million people. These are dwarf clusters. These are not clusters at the Chinese scale. Now, uh, these are not unique to China. In fact, we know since a number of years that uh, cities are dispersing. Here I have a, a graph that I use often. Uh, this graph for some cities, it's a little old because I, I collected the data as I worked in cities. Uh, so uh, the, the sample is not completely unbiased. Uh, I, I never bore data uh, ready made from uh, other things, especially on densities because I don't trust the way people calculate densities. Uh, so here I have uh, 12 cities which have nothing to do with each other on three continents. Uh, I have here Rio de Janeiro, 
Buenos Aires, Mexico City, Paris, Stockholm, Barcelona, Bangalore, Jakarta, and Bangkok, and here Atlanta, Los Angeles, and New York. So we have here 12 cities which have nothing to do with each other, uh, which have very different history, economy, culture, climate. Uh, some are very old cities, some are relatively recent. Uh, all of them has one thing in common. It is the gradient of density. In no cities in the world you have uniform density. Densities always decrease toward the periphery. Some people call it sprawl. What's the difference between sprawl and just normal suburbanization? Uh, you know, I'm not so sure we have a measure for that. I, uh, I agree that there is such thing as sprawl that means an inefficient use of suburban land. That I will agree. But it is not because the density is lower in suburb than it is in center. It's because part of the land is unoccupied because there are a tenure dispute, because uh, the, the, the government is uh, unable to provide infrastructure in some area, because they didn't build a bridge in time to develop a certain area, so an area stay undeveloped and things like that. Uh, the fact that the density is lower in the suburb than in the center is not a bad thing. It's even indispensable at the life of city. If the cities had uniform densities, uh, that will mean uniform land prices. Uh, that will mean that land will be unaffordable to most people and a lot of activities. You could not have a, a bakery making bread in very expensive city, in a very expensive neighborhood, if they compete with a corporate lawyer, you know, for space. So that's why you have low density and high densities. We have to accept that. Again, it, to have low density in the suburb is not the same as wasting land. And there is a lot of wasted land. But that's not the same thing. So we have to accept that a city uh, requires high density, that means high prices for land and low prices for land. And a city needs that. What is the trend? Here is something that I did in Atlanta. Some, you know, it's a little old now, but I'm sure if you did it again for the last, uh, uh, you will find the same thing. I started from the center of Atlanta and I divided it by a ring of one kilometer. And I calculated the number of jobs which have, between two census, uh, the number of jobs which have increased or decreased within three areas, you know, by distance, but within this distance, divided into three areas. The one which are within uh, walking distance of the subway, and I put as walking distance 800 meters, that normally Americans don't do, they usually put 500 meters, I think, but I extended it to 800 meters, I like walking. And, uh, and then uh, in blue are the, the jobs which are within 800 meters of a bus line. And in gray, the jobs which are not within the 800 meters of any transit system. Now, the growth of jobs by distance from the center between two census time, look at that, 77% of the job added have been outside the, the system. And again, we don't quite know how to link those jobs into a transport system which will allow them to have a, a unified labor market. And I'm only talking about Atlanta here, which now has what, uh, 4 million people now. It was 3.8, I think, at the time. Of it. Now, this is Atlanta. You would say, well, of course, it's a, you know, it's a city of the car, it's normal, it's a relatively new cities. Now this is Seoul. And I did again the same thing uh, between then 2000 and 2009. And look at job, I, I could not disaggregate by, uh, by access to transport, but just by uh, distance from the center. 
So again, here, uh, vertically, you have the number of, uh, of additional job between uh, at one uh, kilometer interval added between the census. And, uh, and in, sorry, the, the job are in red and the population is in blue. So you see that the way, the way Seoul has grown, and Seoul is a very, very dense city, one of the densest in the world. You know, the, the municipality of Seoul has 12 million people, and if I remember well, the average built-up density in Seoul is uh, 280 or something like that, it's close to 300 people per hectare, which is, you know, uh, uh, nearly double the density of Manhattan. You know, and this is for the entire 12 million, huh? so it's a very dense city by world standard. Now, this dense city extends only here to kilometer 12 or 13. You see that there have been a, a, a slight densification of job in this density, a loss of population in the city itself. Most of the job, though, has been added at between 20 and 40 kilometers from the center. And again, except with cars and motorcycle, we don't quite know how to access those jobs or to integrate them in it. But here we have a, a city with a very elaborate public transport system, and in spite of that, jobs are decentralizing in the suburbs. So again here, we have to take that seriously. We cannot tell the planners, prevent those jobs from being created there. Make that the job all happen within 10 kilometers of the city. Impossible. They cannot do it. There's something about it that is necessary. So this again, uh, you know, just to illustrate the point here, uh, Seoul again at a larger scale, and uh, you know, and and uh, Paris at a larger scale. Uh, you know, in Paris, 70 percent of the trips are from suburbs to suburbs. You know, when you, we all visit Paris, you take the subway, you know, you go from the Louvre to the Sacré-Cœur, this is wonderful, this is the way it works. You know, wouldn't it be wonderful if uh, all the cities work like that? This is only a tiny part of Paris. The economic entity represented by Paris is in fact 70% of the trips, suburb to suburbs, which are mostly, not all, but mostly done by car. Why? Because you have dispersed origin and dispersed destination. And if you have dispersed origin and dispersed destination, no transit system is viable in this case. Uh, m many of you maybe even know this graph already. It's just to show how, you know, how, uh, how uh, trip, you know, commuting trip vary depending on the structure. So first we have the uh, here, the, the traditional monocentric system, uh, you know, with, with the center, which group most of the jobs. So you have trip with dispersed origin, but concentrated destination. Then you have the model, which is uh, represented maybe by Atlanta or Los Angeles, uh, where in fact, the center is not very, very much denser than the rest. And the trips are completely randomly distributed, practically, and therefore, all the trips are, uh, you know, from dispersed origin, dispersed destination. Very, very difficult to develop a transit system in this situation. Uh, would, uh, if you had a transit system, which, will it change the land use? Try to model it and see what it will take to change the land use. Uh, it's nearly impossible. You know, you will have to destroy about two-thirds of the housing stock, which exists, you know, to do it. You cannot densify, you know, if, uh, if you take Atlanta, for instance, and you decided that for the next 20 years in Atlanta, uh, Atlanta at the time was growing at 3.5% a year, which, which is very high for it, but it, it did at the same time. So if you imagine during 20 years, Atlanta grows at 3.5%, 5% a year. You have a, a dictator on the whole uh, metropolitan area, not only Atlanta, the city, but metropolitan area. These dictators say, no more greenfield development. We will grow only through densification. So whenever you have individual house, you will have a flat. 
let's say that this dictator is not overthrown by the mob and that he can implement it during 20 years and he or she and uh, or and that the city keep growing at 3.5% a year in spite of that now after 20 years of this regime the average density of Atlanta will have gone from 8 to 18 people per hectare which is far below what is required to have an efficient transit system. So you see the idea that if you develop a subway, even if during many years you have no client for it because the density is too low, that eventually they will come, mathematically, geometrically, it doesn't work if the city is very large. If the city was very small, you know, if the city was 5,000 or 10,000, yes, of course, everything is possible but not on large cities, already large cities. So they have to find, and again, my argument will be the same in the Chinese cluster. So the other model, which is the most common, is of course the third one here, where I, what I call the composite model, where, you know, represented by Paris, for instance, or, or New York, where you have a very strong center, you know, very strong traditional center, but you have also suburbs, and you have a, a, a large number of trips from suburbs to suburbs. Finally, on the fourth here, I have a model that I always put forth because I found it in a lot of master plans all around the world, but it exists only on master plan, or it exists only in the mind of planners. And if it could exist, it would be wonderful. That means that you could have a large conurbation, but you could have a lot of little centers and people will work next to their job. So they could bicycle to their job. You have solved the transport problem forever. You have solved their health problem forever. You have reduced energy. It's wonderful, uh, but it doesn't exist. Uh, so you re remind me of a, a Woody Allen movie where uh, I think it was the uh, Red Rose of Cairo, where there's a lady who is describing her fiancé and saying he's handsome, he's generous, he's intelligent, he's rich. Of course, he's fictitious, but you cannot have everything. And this is exactly that. You know, it cannot, why it cannot exist? It cannot exist because it completely contradicts what we know about labor market. You know, this means that, in fact, you have a fragmented labor market. Try to imagine yourself living in a city like that. You live somewhere, you have a good job. Let's say you are close to your, your bicycle. And suddenly you are offered a better job somewhere else. Do you change, you know, you change housing because you have a new job? Uh, do the person who recruit you in this new job say, no, no, we have a policy to hiring only people who live within 800 meters from our, you know, our office? Obviously not. If you move to a city like Washington or New York or Shanghai, it's not because you want to work 500 meters from your house. It's because you want to have the opportunity of a very large pool of employment where you can change jobs uh, you know, to do what you want to do. By the, Many of us, too, have partners, and those partners are not working at the, usually at the same place as we are. So again, this will contradict, contradict this model, you know, that uh, this model do not exist. Do not lose time exploring this model. Now, when we are talking about Chinese cluster, then it's even more complex than that. This is what we have now. So we have dense nodes where individual transport is practically impossible because of the real estate constraint I talked to about at the beginning, that individual transport consume too much real estate. And, uh, but then you have also lower density area in between where you have plenty of jobs and people living and that you have to serve. And again, only the motorcycle right now is satisfactory. Transport mode addressed. Look at those adjustments. This is Beijing between uh, 86 and uh, 2010. So in green, we have, so that's, uh, the mode is, green is a bicycle, 
red is transit, uh, blue is a car, individual car. Uh, you see the change, the very rapid change, you know, from 86 to 2010, that's what, for 14 years. Uh, and uh, you see that the bicycle went down completely. Part of it was a government policy. They made it uh, a little, you know, they closed a lot of bicycle lane. Uh, they didn't favor the, but a lot of it was consumer demand. You know, frankly, bicycling in Beijing in winter and in summer is not exactly uh, a piece of cake. Uh, you know, it's very hot in summer, very, uh, very cold in winter. Uh, so there, there was, you know, uh, a, you know, consumer demand. Another phenomenon in Beijing too is that in '86, it was still pretty much a socialist system where people would uh, work all their life in the same job, and very often, even if you had a couple, they would both work in the same factory. You know, that's the way uh, because people never move. And then suddenly you have a, a more market-oriented city and job disperse and people uh, uh, educate themselves and suddenly they want to look for a job that interests them, not a job which is close to their house. And that's what you have. Now, what's interesting is that y you have a, you see here transit, that's where, by the way, this is buses and subway uh, aggregated. So during a long time, uh, it was flat, and, but it corresponded also, at that time, uh, the government didn't invest very much in uh, subway. You know, the subway started when they decided to have the Olympic game, and then uh, some years before they started investing, and then they went very fast. So you see here cars, so again, here you see why car going up like that. It's economy growing, income growing very fast, and people moving, in fact, uh, a little from transit to car, but a lot from bicycle to cars because they had a higher income and they decided that it was either more comfortable or faster, or even faster. Now here transit is above it uh, to go, you know, higher than car as, as a mode split. It took, you know, at the time in 80, in, in particularly 2000, uh, the length of the subway in Beijing was about 60 kilometers, which is not very long. Now it's 450 kilometers. So you see, it took more than 10 times the length of the subway line just to get transit a little above cars here. So you imagine the amount of investment it requires. So, the same thing for, not same thing, but different story, but you see again those adjustments uh, in Hanoi, this is Hanoi, the, the second line. Bicycle also, same pattern as in China. But instead of being transit and car fighting each other for model split, it's a motorcycle, completely dominant. Uh, the transit system practically inexistent. Uh, they are building now a subway. I'm not sure of the way it's built that it will attract that many trips, frankly. Uh, but I won't go into that, why it is so. Uh, the motorcycle, if it is acceptable socially, it's not the case in every city, uh, it's a fantastic way to move around in a city because, again, it handles dispersed destination and uh, uh, dispersed origin. Uh, it has one enormous drawback, noise, pollution, and it's dangerous. Noise and pollution can be solved very easily by technology now. Electric motorcycle, as are used in some Chinese city like Chengdu, as actually they have a problem is that they have they don't make noise, and uh, you know so a lot of people get run over by them because they don't hear them. So now they are obliged to have a little noise in front so that they warn pedestrians that they are coming. But they allow relatively long distance. They are completely independent, and they rely on the grid. So they don't pollute. At least they don't pollute in the city itself. They pollute at, uh, you know, at the time, you know, where the, the generation of electricity is, which is, of course, another issue. And finally, you have Paris. And, of course, Paris, uh, 
it's a, it's a belt city. The, the car is by far dominant. Again, it's metropolitan Paris. Because, you know, it's it slight inflection when the government, uh, you know, enlarge very much the, the transit system to, to suburb with very rapid transit. But really, you, you don't see any, any big change. Of course, there have not been in Paris any change in income the way it has been in Hanoi and Beijing. You know, income are practically stagnant. And, uh, you know, you don't have that much migration itself. All this, this slide to show you that uh, the mode adapt to income uh, and also to the pattern of job distribution. I think that, so here is the way I, I divide transport. You know, uh, sometimes when I read, uh, think about urban transport, uh, there is a tendency in literature is dividing uh, transport mode into good guys and bad guys. And uh, I think it's wrong. You know, sometimes the bad guy can become good after some technological change, and some good guys can become bad uh, in some sense. So I think that it's better to look at uh, a transport just by, uh, by three, three things uh, that, you know, that they serve. So I have individual transport. I have shared individual transport. So that, uh, that I, I, I include carpool in that, by the way, taxis and carpool. And then I have collective transport transit. That means subway and, uh, and buses, you know, regular buses. So this is the way areas serve individual transport and shared individual transport serve the entire road network. You don't need to be close to a, a network that the government has set up, you know, like, like a subway or a bus line. Schedule on demand. That means that if you are on a night shift and you end up at 4 in the morning, you have access to it. Uh, you know, uh, that's the case of the bicycle, walking, electric scooter, thing like that. And then from where to where, door to door, that means dispersed origin, dispersed destination. Collective transport, the, the problem of collective transport is it's limited to the network. It's on fixed schedule. It's nearly impossible to have, uh, you know, a, for instance, say, uh, I live in New Jersey and I commute to New York. I have a bus which outside the very narrow window at rush hour runs every hour. Now, this is not very convenient, as you can imagine. Uh, so this fixed schedule, you know, is not a bad thing if the schedule is every three minutes. You know, it doesn't matter. That's fixed. But if it's not every three minutes, 24 hours a day, it's not convenient for a number of, of users. So you have to compare those things. Uh, all those are available. All those can contribute. My guess is that in the future, the share individual transport combined with transit would be the best solution. And again, that's a part of my talk where I'm thinking aloud. Uh, instead of being two parallel system, you know, now it is two parallel system. Uh, although sometimes you can park your car in the suburb and take the metro, but look how many, uh, how many of those parking lots you have. How many. This represents a, a tiny little thing because if they represented a very large uh, number of commuters by parking, you will have enormous parking. And if you have enormous parking, you will have traffic jam getting into the parking, getting out of the parking. So you have not solved the problem. Uh, what we need if we combine share individual transport with rapid transit, we could probably serve those very large clusters, including those dispersed population that we don't know how to serve now. When it comes to, this is something maybe I, uh, uh, you know, what's interesting now that when we have this 
complementary, you know, dual system, individual car transit. Here I have a number of average commuting travel time. This is a commuting time. It's not uh, the average time that, you know, if people one day take, take the thing or not. It's, it's commuting. USMSA, Singapore, in blue are the cars. Singapore, Hong Kong, Dallas, Fort Worth, Paris, New York. Below, transit. And this, sometimes it's bus and, you know, uh, Singapore, bus, transit, Hong Kong, that's, uh, that means bus and, and uh, uh, metro. Uh, transit, New York, bus and metro. Subway, Singapore, transit, Paris, transit, USMSA. What you see that in spite of the enormous traffic jam, you have a shorter time when you use individual transport when, than when you transit. Now, this is possible in Singapore, for instance, because you pay such a high, you know, because they limit, they, they limit the number of cars in Singapore. If it was completely free, probably uh, the, the time by car would be about the same as transit. So those two are complementary, but this is what is wrong in the system in a way. When you, in a system like that, when you encourage people uh, for taking transit by whatever means you take, you know, alternate number one day or something like that, what, you, what are you saying really? You are saying, we want you to spend a little more time on transit so that the people who remain in their car have a shorter time commuting. This is not what, uh, by the way, Singapore is doing. Singapore is charging, you know, an enormous amount of money first to get a car, and then they are charging depending on the hour of the day where you use a car on a highway or in the center city. And Singapore is telling you, if you buy a car at our price, at the auction price, we guarantee you 30 kilometer an hour speed in the center of the city. So. It is not a punitive thing. It's not to punish you for you the car. It's to reflect the real cost of operating a car in Singapore. They charge you for the real estate. But they guarantee you this speed of 30 kilometer. And if they were guarantee you only, say, 20 kilometer, uh, probably you'll have more people uh, that will mean more cars, more people taking cars. Uh, probably a slightly shorter commute for those uh, taking cars. So you see, uh, our system as it is now is not, uh, you know, it's not very convincing if we want to go for, uh, further, you know. Uh, by the way, all my cities here are pretty dense except Dallas Fort Worth. You know, the idea that Dense cities have shorter commuting time than not density is not true. Sorry, it's not true. Uh, Hong Kong is by far the largest city uh, in my sample here. And uh, it has a superb transit system. So is like Singapore, by the way. You know, you cannot do better than Singapore in terms of feeder buses and you know, that. And this is the maximum. So there is a limit to the technology we are using here. Here is a, I have to accelerate a bit. Uh, horizontally here, I have the speed in kilometer an hour per hour on a, on a line. That means the, the average speed from the beginning of the line to the end of the line for transit. And vertically, I have the passenger per hour, you know, the capacity of the line. Because these are really, when you look at transit, these are the two things which are important. Some people think that the capacity is equivalent to speed. That's not true. You know, if you were putting snail on a, on a road, you would have an enormous capacity because y you could have, you know, thousand snail on one meter and they, they will advance at the pace of a snail. S capacity and speed is not at all the same thing. And if we are talking about those large clusters where you need to carry people over 80 kilometers or 100 kilometers, speed is essence. So here in red, I have all the BRT, I mean, not all the BRT, some BRT that I have monitored. Uh, and so you see them in terms of capacity, uh, you know, Guangzhou and, and 
Transmillennial Bogota practically overlap with the best subway, uh, you know, in, the, in terms of capacity. But in speed, you see that uh, they, they have a limit, it seems, uh, below 30 km an hour. That's about maximum. Uh, again, that's the speed from uh, beginning to end of the station. It is not the speed that the passenger will have door to door. You know, the speed will be probably half of that, uh, even less. So that's just the speed of the system itself. Uh, when I take subways, I can get, for instance, Hong Kong, you know, the, the, most, uh, the, the, the largest line uh, uh, has an enormous capacity, you know, close to, to 80,000 uh, people per hour. It's enormous. The speed is, is, is a little better than the BRT, but not that much. The best speed is, is really uh, the still the recent line, uh, the Line 9 Express. Huh? This is a uh, Line 9 is all, not all like that. It's a one Express. That means it skips three stations every time. So it's, it's uh, so, and this is getting to, you know, 55 kilometer an hour. Again, it is not the speed of your commuting time, you know, uh, for your commuting trip. It's the speed only from the time you arrive at the station of line one and the time you leave the station of line one. So here, what I see is even for the metro, I see a problem with the speed. If we are talking about getting a labor market where you can get from one part of a metropolitan area to another in less than one hour, uh, and this extends on about 100 kilometers, which is the case of Seoul, of Paris, and even more for the clusters, uh, then the, the subway will not get you very far. So what you need really, and in a way the Seoul Express line gives you a hint for that, is a subway with uh, distance between stations which are longer, for long, you know, more express line. But then feeder buses will not work because you will spend too long in feeder buses and transfer. The only thing I think will be shared individual transport, which will pick you uh, at your door, whether it's your office or your home, and bring you to a station. And then when you arrive at the station, bring you from the station to the thing. Therefore, it's not it's a transport for the last mile, which is, uh, you know, it's transport for the last five miles, which means also for dispersed destination, you know, dispersed origin and dispersed destination below five miles or below 10 miles, those shared individual transport will be probably the best way to deal with it. Again, this is not a, a, a fully, um, this to show you the, the limit, the, the slide should have been placed differently. I'm sorry, I apologize. Uh, this is a subway system of Beijing uh, as it was four years ago. You know, Beijing, you have always, you know, if it was a subway of New York, I could say 20 years ago, 30 years ago, it would still be good. In Beijing, you have always to have that. And in red here, you have, when the subway is saturated, the, the, the Chinese have the best data on transport in Beijing in particular. They monitor everything. You know, they don't have, they don't worry too much about uh, privacy of data, and that's uh, some advantages for transport. So in red here are the area at rush hour you have a density within the car of more than six and a half person per square meter. You know, square meter is like that. Six and a half person. So they consider that this is saturation. When this happens, then people have to wait for the next car, and then you have a policeman who will stay there and even prevent people from entering the station. So you have a line to enter the station, and you have zero. So you see here again, it's a form of congestion that we don't monitor. If you push people away from car to subway, but you end up with that, you have really not solved a big problem. You know, if you look at transport mode, you will be very happy. But what is important is commuting time. This is what we should uh, monitor. So again, here and uh, this subway, because it's so new, it's superb. You know, the the door. You know, you, you cannot be thrown on the line because, you have, like in Seoul, also you have a door which opens only when the car is there. I mean, it's superbly organized. And in spite of that, and you see, by the way, that the congestion is not in the center itself; it the line going to the suburbs. You know, and so 
this is a CO2 emission. You know, one big objection about uh, individual transport is, of course, pollution. Now, I think that uh, we are going, I don't know how far, but how fast, to have, to soon have uh, uh, electric car. You know, at least for urban, we should move to electric car. Now, uh, the battery are still costly. You know, they are not completely, you know, with the current price of gas. Uh, I must say I'm a little embarrassed to talk about those things after the last appointment last week of uh, EPA and transport and uh, you know it seems that I don't know we are going into dark age when it comes to environment but uh, let us assume that for the rest of the rest of the world will not be affected or at least maybe the leadership in uh, climate change and uh, you know and, and anti-pollution uh, will be led by China and India in the future, you know. And, and uh, so anyway, uh, you see here, in red here, we have New York subway, the the CO2 equivalent tailpipe emission. Huh? Uh, I'm not counting here, you know. There are several ways of counting, and I have not included here, you know, well to pipe or you know the the complete, uh, you know. You have many ways of calculating carbon emission. Uh, the best way, of course, will be to to calculate, you know, well to pipe. That means the cost of extraction of gas. You know, how much emission you 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 know at the well. And and here it's only the tailpipe. That means I measure the carbon coming out of the tailpipe. So here this is per passenger, uh, uh, per passenger kilometer. So New York subway 67. Uh, there, are, there are grams, yeah. Uh, and uh, urban bus, 180. Urban buses in the US and in the UK right now emit more than, uh, uh, than newer car, not, not uh, ordinary car, but the newer car. Why? Individual car, why? Because, again, the problem of dispersed origin. You know, you have to maintain bus service to be credible outside rush hour, and those buses are often empty or nearly empty. And therefore, the average uh, emission per passenger kilometer goes up enormously to the point of uh, not being competitive with the nearest car. So, below here, I have, at the very bottom, I have the, the Cadillac, Cadillac CTS S vegan. So that you have an extraordinary, what is it, 240 gram per passenger. So, you know, it, uh, I don't know, maybe twice. So it's, this is really huge. Average US car is also uh, pretty high. As soon as you, you go to the average European new car, now I have to take into account now the, the cheating on the on emission that I. You know, I, I did this graph be before the Volkswagen scandal. Uh, well, I, I assume... Oh, by the way, no. Uh, when I measure it, I eliminated the diesel. You know, I had a suspicion of di on diesel before. So that's only a gasoline car, so I'm, I'm safe on that. Uh, then you have the, the, the Toyota Prius and the Volkswagen Polo. So you see that those are... Uh, this is counting uh, one point. Uh, passengers per, per kilometer, you know, per car, per kilometer, the occupancy, which could vary, if, you know, in New York it's a little less than that. So it's calculated on that. You see that this become competitive in terms of carbon emission with, uh, with New York subway. Now we have a purely electric car. And of course, electric car, it all depends on the network you are on. Uh, the US network varies depending on the east, the center, or the, or the Pacific area very much. So, but if I take the average, uh, a purely electric car, so you see an electric car in the US average have practically as much uh, carbon emission as a Toyota Prius. Uh, but if you are in the Midwest, it will be much higher. If you are in California, it will be lower because of the grid, because in California, a lot of uh, the electricity is coming from hydroelectric and, and uh, 
atomic energy. Now, if you move to Europe, and Europe 15, suddenly it goes down tremendously. You know, here I have uh, the, the BMW, Volkswagen, E-Golf, Nissan Leaf, and the Tesla. Because, of, uh, because in Europe, you have a lot of uh, uh, electricity generated by nuclear and uh, hydro also. You know, Sweden is... And then if I move to Sweden, practically your carbon emission per kilometer passengers is nearly the same as if you were jogging. Uh, you know, because Sweden happened to have mostly uh, hydro, you know, mostly electricity, either hydro of, uh, or nuclear. So it has practically no, no electricity generated by, by uh, uh, you know, by, by coal. So you see again here, we, uh, the, the problem of, uh, uh, of pollution, you know, or, or global warming is there, but I, th I see a, a distinctly, uh, you know, distinct uh, solution, uh, you know, technological solution coming. And that's why I think you should not dismiss individual transport, shared or not shared, as a possible component of your transport system just because of pollution and global warming. I think it would be a mistake. Don't forget that if there were more electrical electric car, which is not the case now uh, in the US, it's what, 0.4% or 0.5%, something like that. So it, it's not very much. Uh, it will be much easier to improve the emission of the grid, you know, of, of the individual generator of electricity, and in particular to include more renewable than it is to, for individual cars which have a gasoline engine to improve, you know, to, to check every tailpipe to do what, what Volkswagen managed to, to avoid, you know. If the Volkswagen car has been electric, you will have only to monitor the source of electricity, not 10 million Volkswagen cars. So this is just to tell you that, again, this is open, but uh, the, the argument against combining individual uh, vehicle with transit is not, you know, it's not a question of pollution or, uh, you know. So here, one, one thing which inspired me very much was this little vehicle here on the, on the right. This thing came spontaneously in Beijing. I was looking, you know, uh, I was taking the subway and uh, I like to go to the, to the last station of the subway to look what happened at the end of the subway, whether what type of density we ha you have, what type of land use, and all that. And I found that every time I went to the end of the line in Beijing, I had those little, little car here, tricycle, which are enclosed because, again, because of the climate, which are illegal. My Chinese colleague told me, this is terrible. Those things are illegal. And uh, that was a substitute for the feeder bus. You know, there were feeder buses at the end of the line. But those feeder buses uh, are slow. At outside rush hour, they come every half hour, which is not very convenient. You know, if you arrive at uh, 10 o'clock at night at the subway station and you have to wait half an hour for a bus to bring you home, it's not very pleasant. So those are informal. They work particularly well because now uh, people call them on their telephone when they arrive at the station. So it's not Uber, but it's nearly Uber, because they, as they do always the same trip, they call them, the, th those uh, little uh, uh, tricycle come at the station, and they are, there's something also very clever. They are loaded by the back. So that means on the sidewalk of the subway, you, you know, it takes only one meter. Every vehicle takes only one meter, and it's ready to go. Compared to a taxi, look at the taxi at Union Station here, the line of taxi waiting at Union Station, and you have only three or four taxis who can leave at the same time. At the Beijing Station, because of those little vehicles, you can have 50 vehicles leaving at the same time because of the design. Uh, now, Toyota recently has developed a, what they call an e-road personal uh, you know, mobility vehicle, and they, 
you know, it's basically a glorified motorcycle. It doesn't take much more real estate than a motorcycle. That's what I like about it. It's electric, and it, uh, you know, they decided for the moment that they are not going to sell them to individual, but they will be part of a system. And so, some of them are stationed at, uh, you know, ra suburban railway station in the suburb of Tokyo, and they are about five or six stations, which are equipped like that. And they are start and they are tried also in the city of Grenoble in France, uh, next to the railway station. So basically, you you have this, you have a, a credit card, you know, you access them with a credit card, you know, it's a bit like the, the bicycle here, you know. And, but my understanding is that you can keep them home for, you, you pay for it probably, if you live in a suburb and you bring them back the next day, you, you are charged, you know, like the bicycle by the hour, but you don't need necessarily to bring them back immediately. So this is experimental. How many do they need? For instance, I could see when I see that immediately, because I, I'm always thinking of real estate, that you could improve very much the design here by having a flat side and parking them really next to each other and having just to pull them out. So you could, you could game, you know, you could park probably three times more of this because this is really the cornerstone, you know. If you have only 10 of those at every station, it's not useful. You need 500. You need 500 at every station. So if you have a normal parking lot, 500 is a lot of, lot of land, very expensive, and is also it will mean, if not well designed, traffic jam to come in, traffic jam to come out, slowing down your time. You need to design those things for that. And of course, now the, this is, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of uh, Google self-driving car. Uh, I don't know what will be the impact. I've tried to find out. I don't know. I don't know how fast it will come. I rode in one of those cars at Mountain View for half an hour. I was really impressed. Uh, you know, st I could see the car identifying a dog crossing the, the a jogger. Uh, you know, jaywalking or something like that. It was really impressive. Now, uh, so far, they don't, you know, they are not sure they work with snow or fog. So that's a long way to go. But uh, I think that that will contribute in the same. If those cars could work, you know, and again, as a shared individual transport to either go door to door or door to station, that will solve the problem of those clusters. And suddenly, you will have an increase in productivity in cities. Increase of productivity means increase in salary, in welfare for the people who live there, and spending less time commuting. This is what I, you know, last time I was in Gauteng in, in South Africa. You know, Gauteng is a metropolitan area, Johannesburg, uh, Pretoria. Uh, so it's a city of, it's a conglomeration of about six million people. I, I was looking at case studies of uh, a transport survey. I saw a woman uh, who, who clean offices, uh, you know, she lived in the middle of Hotang and she cleaned offices in Pretoria. She spent five hours a day commuting to her job. She has a decent salary, she has a decent house, so she's not, you know, she will not be considered as poor in our statistics. But a person will spend five hours per day commuting. This is a new proletariat. This, you know, the proletariat now, the, the, the people who are at the bottom of the scale are not necessarily anymore people who are starving or uh, have not enough money to buy clothes. They will be people who, to, to have a decent salary are obliged to commute five hours a day. F think of it, five hours a day, that means there is no time at all for a family, for children, for anything we like about cities. You know, I was uh, joking at the beginning and saying, well, uh, you know, cities are labor market and, uh, you know, labor market is what's the most important. Anything we like about cities, you know, uh, having a drink with friends or going to a museum or a concert is possible because of that, but 
this woman is part of the labor market. She works every day. She has a, a, a formal job. She's doing an essential thing. And she's commuting five hours a day. So there is no concert for her. There is no schooling. There is not even spending any time with her children to transmit any culture she might have. So I think this problem is very, very serious. And again, the problem is hidden because of, uh, I think we, we don't measure uh, commuting time the right way. You know, we should not concentrate just on distance or on, on quarrel between modes. We should look at this commuting time. It's a very serious problem. Thank you.